Having children is one of the most rewarding and one of the most challenging experiences anybody can ever have. I mean, let's face it, we all go into it as parents to be with these grand ideas of how wonderful and how rewarding and how awesome and how much fun it's gonna be. And then we go through these seasons in life as our children age, as they start to develop their own little brains, their own little minds, as their own wills come into play. We find ourselves clashing, and sometimes that clashing can be real intense and it can last for a period of time. And it can be very, very, very disillusioning, perhaps even, at some points in a person's experience raising children in a family. Jesus used this idea, this, this disappointment that can often attend parenthood, this idea that sometimes our grand dreams of the happy family can disintegrate into nothing when all of a sudden our children decide that they want to live in a way or choose a path that is totally contrary to our values as a family, totally contrary to our best intent as a parent and our vision for their life. Jesus told the story of a man with two sons. And his two sons lived and worked faithfully in his household as they did in those days. They, they shared the responsibilities. It was seemingly a wealthy family. There were servants involved in the household, but the sons were obviously going to be the heirs. But one day, the first son shows up and he says to his father, you know what, I'm actually tired of living here. I'm tired of living under your rules. I think there's a better life out there somewhere. I'm going to take my leave. I'm going to go. I'm going to live my own life. I want out. Oh, but by the way, Dad, before I go, I want you to give me my share of the inheritance that you would have given me when you died. I want that now so that I can go and establish my own life. I mean, if you put yourself in the position of that father, how do you think you would feel when your son essentially comes to you and says, I can't wait until you die. Give me your stuff. I mean, that is like, that is like heartbreaking, right? So you've been living with me all this time, my boy. All this time, I have loved you as a son. And all you've seen in me is essentially a bank account waiting for the day that I die. I mean, the, like, I don't know how I would have reacted to that. I think I would not have been as gracious as the man in the parable who actually followed through with the son's request. He actually divvied it all up, gave the son his share, knew he was going to go and squander it and waste it, and off the son went. Left home, going to go live his life, break all his father's rules, do what his mates looked like they were having fun doing, and he just felt so trapped and so restricted by the father's household and by the rules. Well, now he was free of it. Now he was off on his own and he was going to go and do it, and that's exactly how the story goes. We read about this story in Luke chapter 15, and it says here of the son that when he had spent everything, a severe famine occurred in that country, and he began to be in need. Verse 15 says, He went and attached himself to one of the citizens of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. He was longing to fill his stomach with the pods that the swine were eating, and no one was giving him anything. Now, you've got to think about this. Jesus is telling the story about a Jewish father, his Jewish sons, to a Jewish audience. You know, the Old Testament in Leviticus chapter uh, 14 and uh, Leviticus, the Old Testament in Leviticus chapter 11 and Numbers chapter 14 describe the idea of clean and unclean foods. While swine or pig or pork of any type to, to, in the Old Testament context and to the, to the audience that Jesus was talking about, that was an unclean food and an unclean animal. They would have nothing to do with it. So the idea that this boy has now squandered all of his father's wealth that now a hard time has come upon that land that he's run away to, and that he now has to go, and not only is he without wealth and without friends that have forsaken him because he can't pay for the parties anymore, not only is he lonely and destitute and without a home to go to, but now this boy is sitting in a, in a pigsty, taking care of these unclean animals, wanting to eat the slop that is fed to these pigs. He is so hungry and he is so desperate, and yet the farmer won't even let him take a handful for himself. I mean, this is the picture of absolute desolation. You cannot go any lower than this. There's only one step beyond this for a Jewish audience, for a Jewish family, and that is death. The shame, the uncleanness, the ceremonial impurity, the unrighteousness that is portrayed in this 
is absolutely devastating. You have a son who is a rebel, who has disowned his father, wants nothing to do with him, has taken his father's wealth, essentially saying to him, I wish you were dead. And he, now he has gone and he has wasted that wealth on riotous living. And now he's feeding pigs. I mean, essentially, if you like, the fact that he's sitting here with the pigs, these unclean animals, is a symbol of his spiritual uncleanness. He is about as low and as far away from the father's ideals, this parent's vision and hopes for his child, that he could ever be. And it is while he is in this place that he remembers something. He remembers his father's household. Suddenly now it doesn't seem so unappealing. Suddenly now in this pigsty, the son is thinking to himself, you know what, what have I done? I thought my father's house was too harsh. I thought that was too restrictive. I thought there were too many rules. But now I've gone, I've lived the dream. I've broken the rules. I've done everything that I could possibly do that I thought would bring me happiness, success, fulfillment, contentment. I mean, while I had money in my pocket, I was surrounded by people who wanted to be my friend. But now in my hour of need, I have nothing. Not even the servants or the slaves in my father's house live this poorly. I know what I'll do. I know what I'll do. I will humble myself. I will go back to the father's house. I will ask for his forgiveness and I will not expect to be his son. I just want to go back as a hired employee. I will be content with simply working for my father as a slave or as an employee. I mean, that's what I'm doing for some stranger here, feeding pigs. I might, as well, I might as well do this in a better environment for somebody who I know has a, has a better heart. And so I'm going to go back to my father and I'm going to ask for his forgiveness. I'm going to say whatever I need to say. I, I simply want a job. That's all, that's all I'm going to ask him for. I know that I can't be reinstated. I know I don't deserve it. The, his hardship, his difficulty, his brokenness, has finally taken apart his pride. It's, it's when he hits rock bottom that he finally realizes, you know what, I had it pretty good. I had it quite, you know, I, I lived, I was living a good life back there. What have I done? I'm an idiot. I'm gonna go back, I'm gonna say sorry, I'm gonna do whatever I can. And if all I get is a, a role of employment, then so be it, I'll be content with it. You know what, this story here, the story of this boy, this is the human story. This is our story. This isn't, this isn't somebody out there, you know, that neighbor, that stranger, that alien across the way there on the other side of the country. This is your story and this is my story. This is the story of humanity in the Garden of Eden when they decided that the rules that God had put in place, the one, <laughs> I mean, the one rule, do not eat from this one tree. All of this abundance I've given you, this, the entirety of the Garden of Eden is yours, not to mention the planet beyond the borders of the garden. All of this abundance, all of this grace, all of this gifting to, to the human race, and one little test of loyalty. And Adam and Eve decide, you know what? That's too much for us. The Father's house is too restrictive. What the other guy is offering is much better. We could become gods. Why would we serve God when we could become gods, right? And so they buy into the lie. They decide that the enemy, the enemy's enticements, his advertising campaign promises much greater reward than the, than the willing service to a loving father who has created them, given them life, and given them the abundance of this world and the abundance of this planet. And the story is that they shift their relational allegiance. They make the choice to buy into the dream and the aspirations of the other guy, God's enemy, and they, and they adopt that philosophy. They give that enemy political asylum. They make him, by their vote and by their expression of confidence in the, the narrative and the story that he's telling them, they make him the de facto ruler of this world. And so humanity, every individual, and Adam and Eve at the beginning as the head of the, head of, as the, head of the human race, have gone out and separated themselves from the Father. They've said, we will live our own dream, we will live our own aspiration. We don't think you have our best interests at heart. The story of the prodigal son, it's the story of you, it's the story of me. And this idea of him hitting rock bottom, it is often the story of humanity that only when we hit rock bottom do we finally wake up and realize, wait a second, 
maybe God isn't the bad guy here. Maybe God has been looking out for us all this time because if we've, if we've gone out and lived the dream, right? If we've gone out and broken every rule, if we've tried everything that we know we ought not to, that, that the word of God forbids, and, and then we wake up one day and we find ourselves empty and alone and broken and, and worn out and tired and all the rest of it, we kind of think to ourselves, wait a second, if we were living the dream, right? If we were living the dream, then why am I in this state? Why am I in this place? In this faraway country, living amongst the unclean, feeling unclean, how is it that my heart yearns for something better if in actual fact that was the dream that I was living? If, if the life without rules, if that life of true autonomy was really the rewarding, promising life that it was, that, that it was pictured to be in Satan's advertising campaign, then why am I not re, you know, living the rewards of that lifestyle. Why am I reaping the harvest? That's exactly opposite. That experience is what we call rock bottom. And it's often in that place of rock bottom that we finally wake up to the fact that God isn't the bad guy in the narrative. That all of his restrictions, so-called, all of his laws that seem to, uh, you know, curb our, our autonomy and our freedom and our riotous living, actually, it was to protect us from the brokenness, the consequences of those choices. It seemed like he was restricting pleasure, restricting freedom, but actually he was restricting brokenness. He was restricting relational separation. He was restricting the lifestyle of addiction, the enslavement that comes with that. He was restricting the loneliness that ensues. You know, all those things that none of us want in our lives, but are the consequences of certain lifestyle choices. Actually, it turns out God wasn't trying to stop us from living the good life. He was trying to ensure that we would live the good life. And he knew in advance, like any parent does raising little children who are unable, they don't have the foresight yet to recognize that this choice or that choice will lead to physical harm or, or relational harm. And so they want to do things and parents are like, no, 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 no. We don't do that. We don't, we don't talk that way. We don't shout that way. We share our toys. We don't, we don't hoard for ourselves. You know, Parents have foresight that little children don't have. One day when we hit rock bottom in our spiritual experience, it's often in that place that we suddenly realize God wasn't trying to be restrictive. He wasn't trying to hold us back. He was trying to ensure that we would prosper. That if we would trust Him in our short-sightedness, in our spiritual immaturity, if we would at least trust Him when we don't understand why He's saying these things, if we would trust Him, it would save us a lifetime of hurt. It would save us from waking up one day feeling like we're alienated in a far country amidst the unclean, with our lives falling apart, regretting the day that we were born. You see, that is the experience of rock bottom. Do we all have to hit rock bottom? Yeah, I think we all do have to hit rock bottom. But here's my definition of rock bottom. Rock bottom isn't necessarily the same for every person. I believe our rock bottom experience is the place where we realize that our way doesn't work, that God's way is the best way, that God is essentially our heavenly father wanting the best for his children with a vision and a desire for their well-being. Rock bottom is the place where we realize my way doesn't work, his way is best. My picture of God changes to realizing that He's on my side and I'm willing at that point to turn to Him. That is the experience of rock bottom. Now, the degree to which we must go to hit that rock bottom is different for every person. And I believe, I believe from my own experience as well, that the extreme version of rock bottom like this, this kid in the story, right? Or, or the drug addict lying uh, in a pool of his own vomit, um, ready to die from their overdose, right? That, that, or, or, or the alcoholic that has lost uh, their spouse and their family and their, or the gambler who has lost their, their, their livelihood and has lost their home and their everything else. You know, those, those extreme versions, those extreme stories, the nth degree of rock bottom, those experiences, get this, are reserved for the most stubborn amongst us. <laughs> Does that make sense? I think that we all reach a place in our experience where we hit rock bottom. It's the place 
Rock bottom is the place where we realize that our finite human resources are not enough. But there are some of us who are faster learners than others. There are some of us who can be persuaded to turn to God in humility far further up the slippery slope than others who have to get further down. So I don't think rock bottom must necess is necessarily a term that should be used for the most extreme version of rock bottom, but all of us must reach rock bottom. It's the place where we realize that our, our own resources are simply not sufficient and we are willing in humility to turn back to the Heavenly Father, to look towards Him and, go, and, and seek for His grace. That is human rock bottom. But some of us who are particularly stubborn, who are particularly tenacious in pursuing our own agendas with our own resources, we will fall further down that slippery slope and we will experience an extreme version of rock bottom. But it's not necessary to go that far. Simply realize in this moment right now, acknowledge in all of humility that, you know what, you don't have what it takes within you. You can't fix yourself. You can't restore yourself. You can't produce eternal life. Realize that you must turn toward the good Father of heaven. And that is your rock bottom. From there, the Lord will reach down. He will lift you up. And we see that in the rest of our story of the prodigal son here. We see the tenderness and the, and the longing and the yearning of the father for the son. Because as the story progresses, this young boy decides he's going home. He leaves the pigsty. He gets back on the road toward home. He's walking uh, now within an eyesight of his father's home. And guess where the father is? Every day since the son left, the father has been sitting on his veranda, looking down the same road that his son left to follow. He's been looking down that long driveway, wondering if maybe today is the day that the son will return. And sure enough, eventually, after many days, months, maybe even years have passed, there he sees the unmistakable gait of his, of his son. You know that everybody has a unique walk, the way they carry themselves. He recognizes it. He sees it from afar off. And he knows, this is the day. My son is coming towards home. He's headed in this direction. And we see not only the the heart of the Father and the fact that He sits there every day and watches and waits with anticipation. But then His next move, He jumps up off of His veranda chair. He heads down the pathway. He runs towards His Son. And He throws His arms open and embraces this foul, swine-smelling Son of His. He embraces Him. He sees the rags. He smells the stench. And yet he rejoices that his son has returned home. There is no amount of filth. There is no amount of uncleanness. Remember, this kid's been with the pigs, right? There's no amount of uncleanness that will stop the father from rejoicing over the fact that his son has come home. That right there, that is the heart of the father. What's going to be the next move? Is, is the lecture going to come? You know, uh, is, is it going to be the I told you so conversation? <laughs> I mean, the son would deserve it, right? And the son's ready for it. The story goes here that, 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 that the son gets a, a bit of a mumbling out, Father, forgive me, I've sinned against you. And then he says to him, you know, just make me like a hireling in your, amongst your workers. I, I just want a job. And the father's response, <laughs> the father's response is one in which he is to a degree denigrated. Because what he does is he takes off his own outer robe. And now he is standing there with his underclothes, if you like, right? He takes off his outer robe and he puts it around his son. You know, this moment in time is captured in another story in the Bible, in Zechariah. Zechariah chapter 3, verses 4 and 5. And in this story, we have a picture of Joshua standing before the Lord, the angel of the Lord, and he is clothed in, this, in these dirty rags. He is filthy. He is unclean. And then in this, this prophetic parable, uh, the, the Lord takes off a garment and he gives it to Joshua. He clothes him. He declares him clean and he's welcomed 
back into the family. We find the same language, by the way, in Isaiah chapter 61, verse 10, where it talks about the way in which clothing is a symbol of the righteousness of God, that He covers our uncleanness and our impurity and our brokenness and our filth and our stench by giving us a robe of His own making. This language goes all the way through Scripture in multiple stories and multiple books from Genesis to Revelation. In fact, in Genesis, the moment Adam and Eve have sinned and the Father comes looking for them, that God comes looking for them, the next, the next little snapshot you see is that they have been clothed in the skins of animals. Now, the last I checked, animal skins don't grow on trees, right? Something died that day there in the Garden of Eden. Something died, and that's why the, 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 the promise, the slash, the threat that was given to, to Adam and to Eve in the beginning, that in the day you eat of that tree, you will surely die. That, that, that wage of death as a result of their sin, which they had earned, it was, it was overpassed. It was passed by because... They were clothed with the skin of animals. They had tried to clothe themselves with fig leaves. But God said, I will give you a robe of my own devising. And that was the beginning of the sacrificial system that pointed forward to the coming of Jesus. And through his death on the cross, he takes our sinfulness, our stench, our uncleanness, our impurity and our brokenness. And he exchanges what is ours, taking it upon himself, and he pays the, the price of death, the wages of sin is death. Jesus carries that, and in exchange, he gives us his purity of life. His record of sinlessness through his earthly life becomes ours. His overcoming and success against the, against the enemy and his temptations becomes ours. His righteousness, his right living, his right choosing, his perfection and his sinlessness becomes ours as He takes away our sinfulness and He gives us His purity. So, if we carry on looking here at this story, there's another scene that unfolds. There's the rejoicing of the Father, there's the Son who has come home, and then there is the brother who realizes that there's a great celebration going on. Right? I mean, the Father not only clothes Him, but He orders His servants to go and kill the fattened calf to put a celebration on, and the reason for that the reason for that, it says here in Luke chapter 15, in verse 23, Bring the fattened calf, kill it, let us eat and be merry, for the son of mine was dead and has come to life again. He was lost and has been found, and they began to be merry. Doesn't that remind you of the song Amazing Grace? Once I was lost, but now I am found. Once I was dead, but now I am alive, right? This idea that the moment you accept the garment of the Father, the moment He clothes you wherever you've been, however far you've fallen, it doesn't matter to Him. When you accept what He offers you, you go from death to life in that moment. It's an incredible transaction. It is the gift of God's grace received by faith. Well, the older son, of course, comes out. He hears all this, this celebration. And then it says over here in verse 27, He said to him, Your brother has come. Your father has killed the fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But he became angry, the older brother. He became angry and was not willing to go in. And his father came out and began entreating him. But he answered and said to his father, Look, for so many years I've been serving you, and I have never neglected a command of yours, and yet you have never given me a kid that I might be merry with my friends. When the son of yours came, who has devoured your wealth with harlots, you killed the fattened calf for him. The father said to him, My child, you have always been with me, and all that is mine is yours. We had to be merry and rejoice, for this brother of yours was dead, and has begun to live, and was lost, and has been found. You know, perhaps the twist in the story, the twist in the story is what happens right at the end here. Two brothers lived in the same household. Two brothers had the same father. One brother acted out and left because he decided that the father's house was too restrictive. The other brother stayed there. But the twist at the end of the story, just when you're thinking that this older brother is the loyal one, the older brother is the one who, who gets the heart of his father, that's why he stayed, right? Just as you're thinking that, Jesus twists the story and you realize that the brother who stayed, stayed for all the wrong reasons. 
the brother who stayed had a very similar picture of the father as the brother who left. He just decided on a different strategy. The, the, the younger brother, he asked for the wealth, he went off, he wasted it, right? The older brother stayed there waiting for the day his father would die and he would inherit everything. They wanted the same thing. They both saw the father, not as a tender-hearted parent, but they both saw the father as, as someone who was restrictive, as someone who, would, who, who, who they were just biding their time until he was off the scene of action, and then they could really live their lives the, the way they wanted to. So the older brother looks like he's loyal, but he's not really. He's just as self-serving as the younger brother. And his, the, the crack in the armor, as it were, is revealed when the father's heart is on display, his tenderness, his compassion, his forgiveness for the younger brother. Suddenly, the older brother is, that's not fair. How many times as parents have we not heard that very cry from our children, right? We are like the fairness police as human beings, at least when it comes to judging someone else's experience in comparison with ours. Hey, when we're the ones who are advantaged, there's no cry of that's not fair. But when we feel somebody else's advantage, we are so quick as adults and as children to go, that's not fair. Where's the righteousness in that? And hey, you know what? Grace isn't fair. Have you ever thought about that? When you show someone grace, you're not being fair. You're giving them what they don't deserve. When God shows you grace, He's not being fair. He's giving you what you don't deserve. Now, there is justice in the way God provides grace because Jesus took the penalty of sin and He took it for every human being, which means that the playing field is level. So there is justice, but in the moment where you receive grace, which is the opposite of what you deserve, you're happy to accept that and you don't cry out to God going, but that's not fair. But we're very quick to do that with others who we think are getting a better deal than us. And that's what this reveals here. This brother who, was, who lived in the father's house, this brother who, who, who loved, supposedly loved his father, who wanted to be there, was simply biding his time until his father was dead so that he could get his stuff and then start to live his own life, just like the younger brother had done. A different strategy, but the same heart. Neither of these boys grasped the love that the father had for them. Neither of these boys loved their father like a child should love their father. Neither of them perceived the goodness and the kindness and the best intent of the father's heart towards them. And as a result, they were both rebels. One was a rebel at home and the other was a rebel in a faraway country. You know what? I think that often it's like this in the community of faith. Often it's like this in the family of God, those who claim to be called by the, by the name of God, right? Who, who identify them as part of the fam themselves, as part of the family of God, as part of the, the church of God on earth. There are those in the household who decide one day, you know what, I'm going off into a far land, I'm leaving, I'm done with this religion thing, I'm out of here, go and do my own thing. And there are others who stay there, but they don't stay there because they really love God, because they really perceive His character. They stay there because they hope that by their good deeds, they hope that by their, quote, faithfulness, their diligence in religious matters, their, their, their faithfulness in following through with duty and in serving others, that they will earn the reward of the inheritance. And you know what? The crack in the armor is revealed when others who have gone off into the far land return to the family of God. You see, this story here is you and me. This story is the story of all of us lost, some in a far land, some in the household of God, all in need of the grace of God. And this story comes as the third story of lost things in Luke chapter 15. We have the story of a lost sheep, we have the story of a lost coin, and then we have the story of a lost son, maybe even two lost sons. And have you noticed that the fraction increases? You have one lost sheep, right, which, is, which was one of a hundred. And then you have one lost coin, which was one of ten. And then you have one lost son, or maybe two lost sons, which is one of two or two of two. You see, there, there, there's a progression here. Not only does the fraction increase in value, but the intrinsic value as well. A sheep is lost, which the moment they have ewes, the moment the ewes have lambs again, will quickly be forgotten. It will be made up for in the loss, right? Or in the new gain. Then you have the story of the lost coin. 
And of course, over there we have something of monetary value that would be hard to replace. And then we have the story of lost people, lost children. Jesus is building as he tells these parables and he's asking you and me the question, do you understand the value that you have in the eyes of God? Do you understand that you are welcome to return home? Do you realize that the father is sitting on his veranda looking for that first inkling of the response of repentance in your heart, that that turning to come back on the road that you left by, to come home to the father? I want you to notice that in every one of these stories, it is the, the owner of the object that, that, that sees value in that thing and seeks for it. The good shepherd goes after the sheep. The woman who lost the coin searches her house until she finds it. The father sits on his veranda waiting and you say, but wait a second, Adrian, there the pattern's broken. There you see the father waiting for the son to come back. No, no. It was the reminder, the memory of the father in the heart of the son when he's in his rock bottom place that draws him home. It was the goodness and the grace of the father all those many years of parenting before that draws the son back towards the father. And the moment the son responds to that initial kindness and grace of the father, the moment the son responds to it, the father is there to welcome that response. But it was first the goodness, first the kindness of the father over many years of faithful parenting that brought the son to repentance. And then as the son exercised his choice, don't miss that bit, as you and I exercise our choice to respond to that revelation of the grace, the kindness and the love of God. And as we, as we realize that our broken lives have led to nothing but impurity and uncleanness and, and, and brokenness and everything that is yucky and that we didn't want in our lives. And we then turn towards the Father, that, that first inkling, that first, that first prayer off of our lips, that first groan within our hearts. The Father is there. He sees it. He does not miss it. And He moves towards it to welcome us back. I don't care where you've been and neither does God. You are a son or a daughter in the family of God. Whether you've been in a faraway land or whether you've been the faithful religious kind, you need the grace of God. You need that rock bottom experience where you come to the end of yourself and you turn to the grace of God realizing that we can only be saved by His goodness and His kindness. So whether you are the prodigal son lost in a far country or the, or the faithful son lost in the very household, will you turn to God today, humble your heart, trust in His resources, realize the kindness and the love and the yearning of His heart towards you and do not let Satan uh, create that lie and that barrier in your mind that you must first sort yourself out before you come to Him. The prodigal son came as he was, in his rags, in his filth, in his stench, in his uncleanness. And the father welcomed him, embraced him, rejoiced over him, and gave him his own robe to cover his, his, his appearance. That is what the father will do for you if you will turn to him today. Do not delay. Do not try and fix yourself. Respond to the grace of God today. Let me pray with you. Heavenly Father, for the person hearing this, I just pray that this picture that we see in this parable would overwhelm them with a sense of your love, of your acceptance. That they would not hide behind the fear of having to sort themselves out. That they would not shrink behind the idea that they are too far gone but that they would respond to your grace, Lord. You see the flicker of hope in their heart. And Lord, I pray that you'd give them that sense of peace, that freedom from guilt and shame, that thing we call forgiveness and reconciliation. Bless them with that experience in Jesus' name. Amen.